Hi, welcome back. I'm Paul Tilley and this is Marketing Research MR2300. So far in the course we've looked at the preliminary stages of going to conduct market research. These preliminary stages involved, first of all, trying to figure out exactly what the problem was. We normally do that through exploratory research. From there, we help formulate a question, a research issue that we wanted to study. And from there, we went out and we did secondary research to give some sort of a background on exactly what the topic is about. Once we've got our secondary research done, we need to be able to go and conduct some original research. This original research is known as primary research. Essentially, there are three major sources of primary research. Surveys, in which we go out and we ask respondents for a response to some questions that we have. Observation, in which we watch the world unfold as it does and take notes based on that. And thirdly, experiments, where we actually test a hypothesis using a controlled testing mechanism called an experiment. We'll look at each of those over the course of the next few series of videos. This week, though, we're looking primarily at that first form of primary research and the one that occurs most often, and that is the survey. What I've done with this particular unit is I've broken it into two parts. First of all, we're going to look at surveys and how surveys work and some of the challenges with surveys, particularly in terms of some of the errors that result from conducting surveys. And second of all, we're going to look at the methodologies for how do we conduct surveys, what are some of the methods that we can use and actually to collect that survey information. So stay tuned for the next few videos for primary marketing research. In today's video, we're going to look at primary research. We're going to define primary research, discuss the nature of surveys in primary market research, we're going to understand the advantages and the disadvantages of conducting surveys, and we're going to spend a lot of time looking at the various types of survey error. So let's get started. As I've already mentioned, primary research is research that's conducted specifically for the research question that we are addressing right now. Formally, primary research is any type of research that you go out and collect yourself for the purposes of helping to address a particular research problem. Primary data is usually collected through surveys, observations, and experiments. Surveys involve going and asking people we call respondents. These are the people that respond to the survey. We ask respondents what they think of something or what they know about something. So a survey goes out and asks a portion of the population. This portion of the population should be what we call a representative sample, meaning that the few people we ask should represent society as a whole. So survey information can be very useful and very good for market researchers. It can be gathered quickly, it can be gathered relatively efficiently, and it can be gathered relatively inexpensively. If you think about the tools available to researchers today with the internet, it certainly allows us to get a great representative sample of the population to respond to an electronic survey which can be automatically tabulated and automatically concocted to, to generate reasonably accurate results that we can use in terms of our information um, that we make decisions on. The use of survey technology, if it's done correctly, and this is the trick, if it's done correctly, can be, lead to very accurate results, plus or minus you know, 5% of what the real population says a survey can do. So if we know how to do it right, we can get a really good response. And if we can get a really good response, we can get a very accurate representation of what society thinks, which is useful to us as market researchers. But they come with some challenges too, and we have to be aware that market research comes with a, a bunch of issues that, whether we like it or not, we have to accept, but a lot we can work around. For example, respondents may uh, feel encouraged to provide accurate and honest answers, 
but at the same time, there may be reasons where they don't actually give those honest and responsible answers. Respondents may be fully aware of their reasons, but not give their reasons. And if we don't ask for their reasons, sometimes it's hard to distinguish why people do the things they do. Data errors can also result not because of the respondent's fault, but because of the investigator's fault. Was it written down correctly? Was it analyzed correctly? These are big issues that come to play. We'll look at those in a few minutes. And <clears throat> survey questions can lead to unclear data, particularly if the questions aren't worded properly. So the wording of questions is very important. So what we're going to do first is we're going to take a look at some of the issues that we find in surveys. And we're going to go through it sequentially, looking at it from the point of view of the surveyor and the respondent. Okay, let's look forward. If you look at Exhibit 7-1, you will see that there's a host of reasons that surveys can go bad. <clears throat> Generally, it, it flows out of two major points. The first point is that surveys have a certain amount of statistical error. The fact that you're not interviewing every single person in the population means that you're relying on a sample, and this sample may or may not reflect the views of the population. Our goal as researchers is to get as close a reflection of the views of the population as possible. We need to put certain measures in place though, in order to make that happen. It doesn't happen by accident. So poor design and poor execution lead to problems as much as random sample error. Our job is to get rid of the poor design, good design, and get rid of poor execution, good execution. So let's see some of the faults so that we can address them before we ever do a survey. The first issue that we'll look at is look at the potential for systematic error within uh, a survey. Now systematic error is an error that's caused because of the system that we're using. It is within our control as opposed to, uh, as opposed to, to error that's random sampling error which is a statistical variation. Okay? So our major focus will be on the, the things that we can do in our system to ensure that it works well. So of systematic error, when we look at systematic error, it tends to fall into two major categories. Either the respondent causes some problems, it's a respondent's fault, or the survey administrator did something wrong, it's their fault. So let's break it a look, let's take a look at each of those in, in turn. First of all, we'll take a look at respondent error. And the first major respondent error comes because the respondent simply doesn't respond, or non-response error. The respondent's not at home, the respondent doesn't answer the phone, the respondent's eating supper, or any number of reasons that a respondent will not do the survey. The trick is, though, if we've selected so many from our sample, if we're sampling so many people, every time you take someone out of the sample, it becomes less representative. Less representative of the population means that the accuracy of the survey comes into question. We also have, uh, instead of a response, a uh, non-response bias, we also have a response bias, and that is if, for example, the respondent responds with an answer, and something causes that answer to be wrong or not reflective of reality. And there's a number of reasons, and we'll look at those in a second. First of all, let's look at non-response error. Let's look at some of the examples of that. First of all, uh, non-response could be people who simply refuse to cooperate. No, I'm not doing your survey. That's an example of a non-response error. But we could also look at people who are, would be willing to do it, just can't do it now because they're either not at home, not available, or uh, these sorts of things. So we try to compensate for that by ensuring that we can get people at the best possible times and meet them on their terms as opposed to us meeting us on our terms. So it's important to be able to do that. If we don't get rid of non-response bias, what we could potentially have is the problem of um, uh, not a good representative sample, and that means we tend to get bias either towards a certain group or against another group. In terms of response bias, there are all kinds of uh, potential issues there. They tend to break into two major types, either deliberate falsification or accidental or undeliberate, if there is such a word, uh, accidental falsification where people unconsciously make errors. So in terms of uh, deliberate falsification, first of all, we're looking at things like uh, acquiescence bias. Acquiescence bias means I couldn't be bothered talking to you, I'm just going to get this done quickly, so I'm going to agree with whatever you say. That's a form of acquiescence bias. So that is 
They're just going with the flow. They don't really think about their answers. They just hop through their answers as quickly as possible. Or people will say whatever they think you want to hear. That could be a problem. We need, be, we need to guard against that. So some individuals tend to agree with anything. We want to avoid those things if necessary. If possible, that is, if possible. The next one is extremity bias. Another thing that people often do is they tend to select one extreme or the other. So for example, if you have a survey that has a 10 point scale between 1 and 10, how would you rate? People will tend to focus, some people will tend to focus, on one extreme, 1, an anchor, no, I absolutely disagree, would be a 1, or 10, oh, I absolutely perfectly agree. So we tend to have people who sit, instead of somewhere in the middle, they tend to fall on one extreme or another just because it's easy and it's clearly defined. If we end up with this bias, this type of extremity bias, we could end up with some bad results for our survey. So we've got to guard against people who constantly select one extreme or the other extreme. They, they could be, for example, removed from the survey group. The next type of problem is where we have an interviewer bias, and this is could be uh, real or perceived, and that is that the person responding to the interviewer could be affected by the fact that the interviewer is there. They tell the interviewer what they want to hear, what they think they want to hear. The interviewer says something that potentially influences the respondent. What the person, how the person looks, could influence the respondent. So these are things that the interviewer does, either consciously or unconsciously, that affect the quality of the results that come to pass. And this, this could create a serious problem. We also have auspices bias. And auspices bias is the bias that results because they know where you're coming from as an interviewer. Let's assume that you're an interviewer for Revenue Canada. You go out and you start asking people about how honest they are on their taxes. Knowing that you're from Revenue Canada, those people might not be altogether truthful with regards to their answering list. They might potentially say, yes, I'm absolutely honest on my taxes. You know I am. I'm a great Canadian citizen. But those people also know that they're being interviewed by Revenue Canada, and that could potentially, if they say, no, I'm not honest on my taxes, it could have some negative consequences for them. Same thing with cigarette companies. If a cigarette company goes out and asks what people's view of their cigarettes are, people probably don't want to dish the cigarette companies to their face to say, oh, yeah, these things are cancer sticks, you know, they're, they're not good. They might say, well, you know, I'm not a smoker myself and I don't really care for it, but I'm not against it either. So it could be something in terms of the interviewer, the auspices of which they find themselves in that make the difference. Uh, you could also think of the, the day, if it's a miserable, lousy day, people would tend to have a more negative attitude than if it's a wonderful, bright, shiny, sunshiny day. That could be also an auspices effect. Uh, we also have another issue of social desirability bias that comes into play with many respondents, and that is if they're asked a question that they sense may indicate something that is a little off. For example, if the question was, do you use deodorant? Many people will not socially want to admit, no, they don't use deodorant on a regular basis. So they would very quickly and easily say, yes, I do because they know it's socially desirable. And there are lots of examples where questions may be asked that may be sensitive, such as that, that affect people and how they answer the question. Do you, use do you engage in unprotected sex? Do you agree? Uh, do you eat bugs? Do you agree with assisted suicide? These are hot button topics that people will tend to tell people what they want to hear on as opposed to their honest feelings and it creates some sensitivities. So again, social desirability comes to play as a potential error on that. So these are the major ones that, that the respondents run into, major problems that respondents run into and we should guard against those things. As an interviewer, we should be aware of those potential problems. The other set of problems that we often run into are administrative error problems that are resulting from the administration of the survey and who's administering the survey and the problems that result from that administering. So let's take a look at them. First of all, administrative error could be categorized as confusion, neglect, 
or remission. Those could be the key things that, that influence this administrative error. We could probably lump it into one of those categories. Specifically, there are many types of administrative error. We're going to look at the, the key ones. The key one that comes to mind right off the bat is the data processing error. I fill out the survey form, I bring it back, I take the information from the form, and I type it into the computer. And I type it in wrong. Where you select an 8 on your response, I inadvertently type in 10. Or you select a 4, and I inadvertently type in a 1. I could do it purposely, or I could have made a simple mistake. The fact of the matter is, what you wrote and what I put into the computer were two different things, and that results in an administrative error that is known as a data processing error. The next type of error that comes is a sample selection error. And a sample selection error is the administrator's job is to select the proper sample. That is a representative sample that represents the population as a whole. Another common administrative error is the sampling selection error. This, is exact, this happens when we don't exactly collect a sample that truly represents the population. This could be a result of bad sampling, no sampling at all, just selecting people who we figure would be useful for doing a survey as opposed to a totally random sample. But the net effect is that the sample does not reflect the population and because of that the results from the sample are not a reflection of what actually is going on. So we need to be careful when we do sample selection that we do our very best to make it represent the population as a whole and we'll look at that a little bit further on in terms of some of the processes that we use later on in the course. Another common administrative error is the interviewer error, and this is where the interviewer actually makes mistakes in the field. So the interviewer, for example, misses pages of the, of the questionnaire, leaves out questions, doesn't read questions correctly. These are all examples of the interviewer type error, and uh, we can run into some serious concerns if some interviews are tainted because the interviewer has made errors throughout the interviewing process. Another form of administrative error that is all too common is interviewer cheating. And this is where the interviewer does not actually complete the survey accurately at all, but does something to uh, give false results. So if, for example, the interviewer completed the survey him or herself, as opposed to actually going and interviewing people, that would be an example of interviewer cheating. Um, these things throw survey results off totally and result in a very ac inaccurate presentation of what the reality is. So there you have it. There are the major issues with regards to uh, some errors that can result in a little discussion on some of the things we can do to help eliminate those errors. That's part A of this particular video. In part B of the video, we'll take a look at some of the different types of survey methodologies that we can use in order to do uh, good quality surveying.